Hi there, welcome back. It's good to be with you again. I was just thinking this week about when we learned how to walk. Do any of you remember learning to walk? Not many of us do, right? It happened before we were forming core memories in our brain. And even though our brains weren't fully developed, we still learned to walk. But once we learned, we weren't immediately great at it. We had to have help. We had to hold a hand or furniture, and we had to wobble a bit before we got the hang of what it meant to walk by ourselves. So walking is something that we accomplished and learned and kept learning throughout our childhood. We eventually became accomplished walkers and no longer needed anyone's help to walk. Yay us! <laughs> But as we walked through life, we learned when to walk with others and when to go our own way. We also had to decide which way to go often, which road to follow, who do we trust to walk with us. Now walking is something that many of us just take for granted. We constantly look for ways to avoid walking too much in our day. Where we shop, where we park, where they're all calculated to reduce the amount of walking that we must do. When Hank and I go to Walmart, he always asks me, which end are we going in so we can park closer to that door? And there is, of course, the natural erosion of our ability to walk. Limitations in our ability to walk make it difficult to go some places, to live alone, or take care of ourselves. Now we must consider how many steps are involved, and it's simply not as easy as it once was to walk anywhere. And we may once again need help to walk in certain places. And if we're not careful, we can lose our ability to walk altogether. The choice to be active can be taken away from us if we don't continue to walk and make progress in this life. Our spiritual walk is no different for us. We started out wobbly and unsure, but we held the hand of somebody steadier and we got steadier because of them. And as we began to make our faith our own, we learned to walk on our own two feet spiritually. We made a decision for Christ. The Holy Spirit came to live inside of us. We joined a church. We have reoriented our lives to walk a godly path. Now, our spiritual walk is vulnerable to limitations as well, if we allow it. Hurt and pain can hamper our walk with Jesus, causing us to duck into the shadows. Or there are those who have stopped walking with Jesus altogether for any number of reasons. God calls us as believers to walk this way, which is his way. And he has given us the Holy Spirit to hold our hand and help us walk the right way. So ask God right now to prepare the spirit within you to guide you to understand his truth today. Now I'm going to show you a video clip that Gina McLaren took of Marcy Ball that attends our church. The video is 11 years old and was taken during a vacation Bible school event. Marcy was leading the outdoor games and lessons as she usually does. And Gina had offered Marcy help to carry all of the supplies up from the basement and to the park across the street. But Marcy said, no, thank you. Specifically, as you'll hear in the video, she says, I got it. Take a look. <laughs> I wouldn't have done this if you'd have just let me help you. <laughs> Got it? Got it. Isn't that priceless? 
But the truth is that any one of us could have been the person in that video saying, I got it, right? That's our mantra in life. We got it. We may all be on our own individual walk with Jesus, but we're not meant to go it alone. We don't have to, but many times we choose to. We walk the path that God has laid for us, navigating the highs and lows as if nobody else cared about us or our walk. And we do our very best to carry our burdens alone, never asking for help or accepting it. But God would never ask us to go his way without equipping us to do so. And as we continue to learn how to make room for others in our spiritual growth, we're going to look at our walk today. Are we walking in his way or are we going it alone? Are we accepting the help that God has offered to guide us on our way? Now, I want to start today with the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. In these verses, Jesus talks about the help that is coming to the disciples after he leaves. The setting is the upper room on Monday, Thursday, the night before Christ's death and crucifixion. And this is Jesus' last opportunity to speak with the disciples before everything blows up. And one thing he wants to try and impart to them is the help that will be coming their way. Now, it was one thing for these disciples to follow Jesus when he was physically out in front leading the charge. But now Jesus warns that it's going to be a whole different thing for them to carry on the ministry without his physical presence. And those are the words that the disciples don't even want to hear. They kind of plug their ears during this reading and go, la, 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 la. But Jesus tells them, don't worry, that help is on the way. So we're going to read today from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you're all filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can no longer see me. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Okay, so that's a lot of information there, right? And right off the bat, Jesus explains to us why he is telling the disciples these things, to keep them from falling away. He knew that after he left, the events that were going to follow would come as a complete surprise, despite the fact that he warned them. And not only would they lose Jesus, but they would also be thrown out of their synagogues. They would lose their fellowship, their community. They would be opposed by friends, betrayed, persecuted for knowing and associating with Jesus. And even though Jesus says they don't understand all this that he's saying right now, they will remember. The Holy Spirit will help them remember. And Jesus seems to get a little bit frustrated that the disciples are focusing on the wrong thing here. He says, you're filled with grief because I'm going away and you haven't even asked where I'm going. They don't seem to care to understand that his actually leaving is going to be very good for them. Whereas Jesus was beside them in front of them physically, the Holy Spirit will actually be within them. Jesus then goes on to tell how the Holy Spirit will affect each of them individually. And what he is saying is so confusing, so out of this world that he just stops trying to explain. And he says, I can't convey it any further. But when the Spirit comes, he'll give you revelation. Jesus knows what he is saying. It's hard to understand. It's hard to accept. And it'll only be that when the Holy Spirit comes that they will realize what he means. 
and then the spirit will guide them into all truth. Now imagine that you've just learned to walk and the person helping you is letting go of your hand. It feels scary. It feels wrong. But actually it's for our own good. Because if Jesus leaves, we will then have God living inside of us, helping us walk. So we have this help from God himself that comes to live inside each one of us. And the Spirit holds our hand internally, steadying our walk, guiding our path. And we can choose to listen to the Spirit and be guided into all truth. Or we can claim, we got it. and We don't need that help. Now, the Apostle Paul says that when the Spirit comes to us, we will be different. We will be changed. Having the Holy Spirit in us is part of God in us. So that should affect us. Whatever behavior we exhibit to the world is saying, this is who I think God is. And Paul gives us a lesson on walking in step with the Spirit that is helped and guided by the Spirit. And it comes to us, of course, from Galatians 5, 13 through 26, and includes the fruit of the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you can no longer do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, Bits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, and let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Paul reminds us that we were called to be free. And what is he talking about? Free from what? Paul is talking about free from the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, the 639 laws of Leviticus. He says grace has now set us free. Paul, remember, was a former Jew. He was committed to those laws, but he is now a champion for Jesus Christ. And Paul says that in Christ, we have been set free from the law of Moses. But, he says, but, he warns us not to use our freedom as license to sin. Rather, use our freedom to continue to love the world like Christ. The church in Galatia that Paul was writing to has had these two different factions going at it and fighting within their church. Some of them believed firmly that the law was still the way to go and reigned supreme. And others believed that grace, because of what Christ did, was the new law. And so they were fighting in this church. And Paul was trying to say here that even if you disagree on such a, a big thing, that's okay. You should still love one another. Otherwise, you will destroy your church and your community. It wouldn't be the law that would destroy them, and it wouldn't be grace that destroyed them. It would be the fighting between them that would destroy them. And Paul's advice is to walk by the Spirit. Live moment by moment, trusting and submitting to the Holy Spirit. Now, walking is a metaphor used in Scripture often to denote our spiritual progress. People in Jesus' day could not travel as quickly as we do now with all of our planes, trains, and automobiles. For them, and really still for us, walking is the slowest way of going anywhere. But even though walking was slow, walking achieved progress. If anyone kept walking, they would certainly make ground and eventually reach where they were going. So as believers, 
We are to continuously be walking and always going somewhere for God. And Paul reminds us that we have these two living entities inside of us that exist, not just two natures, two entities. God's Holy Spirit is alive within us, but so is our sinful nature. And they don't get along. They battle each other all day long. There's a familiar story I think we've all heard by now of the Cherokee uh, grandfather telling his grandson about the battle that goes on each side of us. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside of us. One is evil in its anger and vices and envy. The other is good, its joy and peace and love. That same fight going on inside of you goes on inside every person. And the grandfather, or grandson turned to his grandfather and asked him, well, which wolf wins? And grandfather said, simply the one you feed. And Paul said the same things in the letter to the Galatians. If you're led by the Spirit, then the Spirit wins. And notice that the Spirit doesn't force. The Spirit invites. If you are led by the Spirit, that's a choice. And if we are led doesn't mean we are no longer capable of sinning. It means now we will choose not to sin. We will think a little longer before reacting and doing. And we will choose not to feed that part of our being that is evil. Now, the works of the flesh, he says, are obvious. Our sinful nature produces ugly works. It's that simple. However, Paul lists for us true characteristics that should be evident if we let the Spirit lead. Paul calls the things that come from our sinful nature deeds. But he calls the spiritual fruit. Deeds are what a person does when he or she works. It's what they accomplish. But fruit is something that emerges because the Holy Spirit is working his power within you. And there is no law necessary against these things because they're pleasing to God. And lastly, Paul reminds us that because of Christ's death, sin has no power over us. It does not control us as it did before we trusted Christ. So we should daily follow the Holy Spirit's leading, accepting that help along the way. Earlier, Paul told us that to walk in the Spirit, now he says, keep in step with the Spirit. Before, Paul was commanding us to walk or walk about, go about our business in a certain way. And that is what we do when we make the decision to follow Christ. We walk with him. And he continues now by saying that we need to keep learning to walk by keeping in step. That means that walking in the Spirit is a learning process that we engage in. Now, the Holy Spirit is God's gift living inside each one of us, helping us walk in his way. The Holy Spirit is so beneficial to our lives that Jesus said we're better off after he left. Jesus returning to the Father enabled the Spirit to begin his ministry within each of us. And the Holy Spirit can live and work in each one of us where Jesus was limited to just himself on earth. So we don't have to seek out the Spirit or meet him at certain times and places. The Spirit of God is within us right now. And we have access to him 24-7. As our counselor, he leads us. He speaks to us, he intercedes for us, he convicts us, and he empowers us. He holds our hand when we're unsteady, and he fortifies us when we're weak. And apart from him, we can't live our faith that Jesus intended. We are confronted daily, hourly, maybe even more, about which way to walk, how to behave. And this is why Paul urges us to choose to walk in the Spirit. Make a conscious decision to allow the spirit within you to lead the way and set the course. If we don't, we will walk by the desires of our flesh, and those desires are short-sighted and selfish. And the results of our walk would be very, very different indeed if we go against the spirit. And one of the greatest things about Paul's command to walk in his way is that he backs it up with help. He gives us these two checklists to help us evaluate how well we're going on our walk with Jesus. 
And the first list, again, are the deeds that we do as a result of living according to our flesh. But the second is the fruit that is produced, the blessing, the benefit of walking in the Spirit. Paul warned that church in Galatia that it wouldn't be the law that divided them, and it wouldn't be the grace that divided them. It would simply be their inability to love one another despite their disagreements. This message is very timely for us in our current culture and climate. When we walk through life guided by our own shortcomings and prejudices, we cause pain, and what we produce is not helpful or good for the kingdom. When we walk guided by the Spirit, our walk will produce fruit that helps God's kingdom. So every moment of every day, God is asking you to walk in his way. Let's pray. Gracious God, we know that it is a tall order to to follow your command, to walk in your righteousness. And yet, Lord, there is no other option. For we want to be like Christ. And so we search out what that means. And Lord, we need that Holy Spirit that you have blessed us with. But too often we ignore it within us. We let it remain dormant. We don't call upon that Spirit to empower us, to change us. So we pray today, Lord, that we would truly remember that you are within us. And we have that power. Help us to unleash it and help us to walk in your way being virtuous people who produce fruit wherever we go. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, it's been good to tune in with you, and I hope we get to see you soon in person. You take care and let us know if you need anything. Have a good day.